Last year, audiences were enthralled with the daring series and or wondering where will the story go next and how can they possibly top the stellar first season? Here to hopefully give us a little more insight is the executive producer and showrunner for Andor, Tony Gilroy. And he brought someone else with him too. Andor himself. Diego Luna! Wow. I think they like your show a little bit. What? Just a little. What? I, I think they like Andor. I'm just going to yell over the yelling. We're all very excited to have you here. Wow, what a thing. Wow. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Saludos. Now, the last time you were at a Star Wars celebration, Andor hadn't arrived yet. No one had seen it. What's it like getting this kind of reception today, but also just the fan reaction to season one? Well, I'm going to tell you, for, as a writer, I don't know how many other writers have ever just seen what I've seen. I'm going to tell you, this is every writer's dream. And I know there's a few writers in this room, I'm sure. Um, this does not happen. So, okay. It's a little overwhelming. This will not happen to you. It's not happening to me. <laughs> this is all a dream. It's uh, it's it's amazing. I mean, we yeah. <laughs> First of all, let me just say uh, that uh, you you are amazing. I mean, this this day has been very special. Uh, <laughs> we we worked really hard, you know, and uh, we were we had an idea of the love around the. Star Wars and and but there, there's no way to to see this coming, you know, this energy of of being around you after we deliver one season and while we are working on the second one, uh, this means a lot to see that you care about what we do. It's so special, like yeah, and we will I. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to set and tell everyone what we went through because what you, this energy needs to spread on set. You know, everyone, everyone doing our Andor has to know that you guys care so much about what we do. Uh, yeah. Hopefully some of them are watching it right now. Since we're live, we're live streaming, they can watch it from set. I know some folks are probably still working diligently today. Diego, I wanted to talk a little bit, go back to the beginning on Cassian for just a moment, and then we'll talk more about season two, I hope, if you'll allow it. Let's do that. So Cassian, of course, we met in Rogue One. He's a completely different character than the Cassian we now know from Andor season one. How do you handle that complexity of this character and still make him someone that I personally want to root for? Does everybody here want to root for Cassian Andor? Got some Cassian fans. I think. Eso, sí. Yes. 
Eso, un saludo a todos los que hablan español por allí, ¿eh? Que sé que son muchos. Este, gracias por su apoyo, la verdad. Eh, qué chingón saber que, que están aquí. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna switch to English. Uh, <laughs> basically, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, I think Cassian is just a regular guy, is someone making choices in a world that is very difficult, you know, to survive in, and it's trying to succeed in finding what, what's there for him. Uh, I, I see just a regular guy that happens to be at the beginning of first season in this horrible circumstance, you know? There is no other way out, you know? And uh, I believe there it's... one way out? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> But uh, I think Tony does something amazing in the way he writes that scene, where the moment where he chooses to pull the trigger, you know, there's no other way. There's nothing else he could do. And you are with him, and you know that his life is about to change in that moment. And, uh, and we live it from, we, we're not judging it from the outside. We are with him, you know? He went there to Absolutely. look for his sister, and now he finds himself in, in this moment, and he has to do it. He has to do it. Uh, it's, a, it's very dramatic, uh, but it's also very realistic. We, how many times we found ourselves in, in a situation that we say, like, we don't want to be this person now, but we have to, you know? Uh, I love how it starts and how complex it makes the whole journey, you know? And uh, it doesn't apply if you judge, if you're looking for in, in storytelling for good and bad, you know, and uh, to choose right away who's going to be the hero and who are you going to regret their actions. Well, this is not that serious. This is about people, real people, with their flaws and contradictions. Uh, and all of that is there uh, from the start, you know? Absolutely. And it all comes down to gorgeous writing, Tony. Gorgeous. <laughs> I absolutely, personally love everything about what you've done with this series. Um, but, Diego, to your point, it is a difficult world. You've built a lot of duality into this. You give us a fresh perspective on the Empire, and we're also seeing behind closed doors of the Republic with what Mon Mothma is going through. Of course, Genevieve was just out here moments ago. Um, what did you want to make sure that audiences understood deeply at their core, in their bones, about both of these factions, the Empire and the Republic, in a way that we had never seen before in previous Star Wars storytelling? I, I want to engage you emotionally all the time. I want you to feel as if everything that you're seeing exists and that it exists off the frame. And everybody knows, I mean, Everybody here knows all kinds of people. <laughs> you know, the neighbor that you despise and the boss that you hate or the, the children that you love, whatever it is. Um, it doesn't, there's no division of heroes and villains in our lives. It's a distinction that we make based on what we feel. So the whole thing for me is everybody, every, they're all the, I, I want you to live through all of them. You know, and, and uh, the Empire is evil at its core for an evil purpose, but the, the practitioners of that, the people who make it happen, are ordinary people. I mean, we don't have to go back and, I mean, it's an easy analogy to the, to the Nazis, but I mean, you go along, people go along. Well, it's, sometimes you're making your, your purchase orders. Sometimes you're, you know, putting the next the next uh, piece of the Death Star on the conveyor belt. It, you know, it's, it's, I want you to live inside all of these people, and that's what I care about. All right, I got to ask about that next piece of the Death Star on the conveyor as well. I'm sorry, spoilers, spoilers. It's okay. 
When did you come up with the idea that Cassian was literally building the thing that will ultimately kill him? We, uh, we had a very short five-day writer's room uh, with my brother Dan Gilroy and Bo Willimon and Luke Hull, who's our production designer, was there, and Zana Wollenberg was there watching. And we just blitzed through. I had about 100 pages of stuff and the beginning and the end. And, but we wanted a prison. And we didn't want to do a prison, as I said before. We didn't want to do a prison unless we could do something absolutely spectacular and fresh because there's so many great prison movies. And if we can't do it, then we can't find something new. And at some point, I really don't remember, and, th and they don't remember either. Someone said, well, what about electric floors? And we're like, oh, well, what about this? And the, this prison started to emerge, this behavioral. And we went back the next day, and then we have to start figuring out what it is they're making and how many guys on the floor and what should it be like. And it's like building a watch. What are you going to do? And um, I think everybody kind of jumped on the idea right away. It's like, well, what if they're building, <laughs> what if he's building the thing that's going to kill him? You know, and um, we were really surprised that it. I mean, some I think some people must have picked up on it along the way, but we were really surprised at the number of people that were actually shocked by when we, we thought that would be. But uh, um, it came up. It came up in the planning. Diego, when did you find out? About I mean, it was pretty clear. I mean, I, and I happened to know <laughs> the, the writer. producer on the show. I happened right, to know the writer the also. I I tend to have dinners with him. Yeah, uh, I get it. we we're we still talking bottles of wine, you know, and friends. we talk about life and what we're doing. And <laughs> now, of course, I'm I'm part of the the process, which is a, a a beautiful thing because, you know, as actors, you normally you get there when, when when things are already moving forward, when everything is designed and and built, you know, and uh, it's so nice to be part of a project when when it's just ideas, when it's sketches. Uh, I, I've been I've been witnessing the process of Luke, of Michael, of like the whole team, and it, it's a beautiful thing because the moment I'm on set, I I own everything, you know. I understand why we are dressed the way we are, why we are sitting where we are, and if you have a question, you can make it when it's time, you know. There's <laughs> so so many things that like we actors do that are wrong, but one is like. Oh, does it really have to be this table? And you go like, no, it, it is this table. We are shooting, you know? <laughs> right. So if you're going to question something, make sure it's, it's time for that question to have an impact and, and, and an action, you know? And here I was invited from the beginning, which is, which is great, yeah. I'm spoiled now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the things I love most about Andor is the monologues. You one-upped yourself, I think, a, a couple of times where I thought, this might be the finest monologue I've ever heard in Star Wars. And then the next week, a new monologue. What makes for a good Star Wars monologue in your mind, Tony? You know, if, and then to the writers out there, I mean, look, you have to have, um, the musket has to be packed. I mean, it has to be, there has to be some momentum behind it. So you can't just have somebody, I've done that though. I started a movie once with a monologue like that. But it has to be, the person has to be in an emotional state to give it. You have to understand what it is they want to say and it can't be some bogus thing that they just want to be speaking. It has to be worthy of the moment. But um, I'll be really honest with you, there, I've written a lot of them. I mean, we did Devil's Advocate, and I mean, I've written all kinds of, I've written a speech for the presidents, and all kinds of things. They're actually, they're not the most difficult thing to write, uh, for me anyway. They're, they're actually, um, they're not transactional. They're, it's, it's, it's really about uh, the potency of the ideas and, and what's there, but there are much, much, Getting eight people in a room that you're introducing for the first time that are speaking together that are trying to tell you something important, that's really difficult. Writing the scenes for Cyril and Edie, those little micro scenes, you know, getting on the frequency to write Cyril and Edie is in many ways more complicated than writing Andy Serkis's big speech at the end. Because you know what he's got to say. And you know what, you know, I mean, and the poetry's the poetry and you have time to think about it, but they're not... And you don't want to think of them as sporting events either. They have to be legit. You, you don't want to say, oh, I'm going to, you know, let's get one in here. It's not like that. Yeah, put, put it in front of Stellan Skarsgård. It, it is legit. It, it helps to very have legit, very quickly. It helps to have Andy Serkis. 
Absolutely. That really gives Absolutely. you a little, it helps to have Fiona Shaw. Fiona it, Shaw, you know. It gives you a big leg up. When you mentioned Cyril Eady, who I love, I also couldn't help but think of Cassian and Marva, another mother-son duo from the show, and Fiona's amazing speech slash monologue at the very end there in the final Well, episode. I mean, that's, that's like a gimme. You get, you get to the point, you go, oh my God, she's gonna die, and we have a hologram. And we did the hologram with Mads and Rogue, so there was like, oh, you know, these things are really powerful. And like, oh my God, if you could give your own eulogy, it's sort of everybody's fantasy, isn't it? Maybe not everybody's fantasy, but <laughs> certainly not everybody's family's fantasy. Um, to have your, yeah, yeah, Granny's gonna tell you what she really thinks now. Um, but boy, that's, talk about packing the musket. I mean, and the whole key to that speech is, what's, there's one line, what'd she say? Oh, I, I remember when I came here when I was like nine years old with my sister and we held hands all the way. And you get that line and you write that line and you go, Oh man, this, that's everything. So she's been coming here her whole life. They do this all the time. Even when I'm saying it, I get, it breaks my heart, you know? Yeah. And so if it breaks your own heart, then it's gonna break somebody else's heart. It broke my heart. Good. It broke my heart over and over and over again and I just kept watching it anyway. Glutton for punishment. All right, I promised we would try to talk about season two. So if we may, are we still excited about season two? Yeah. <laughs> It's gonna, you know, it's gonna be a short talk, right? <laughs> I mean, you're not gonna get us anything. You're not gonna get anything let's from see, us. We've, we've, let's see. we've been tested. <laughs> you, have, you have the really cool swag jacket, but I Thank don't you. know. And also the chair and the tools are really imp impressive. These, you see the, are these torture oh, season now, now two we're tools? Just, now we're just vamping a little bit, I think. I, I, won't, I promise not to torture you, right, but. Thank you. <laughs> Isn't that heavy though? That is it is heavy. It is heavy. To it, right? Yes, it's not. This is not a prop. It's not a prop. No. <laughs> no. This we is definitely not a prop. And, but anyway, yes. All right. I know you can't tell us much spoilers and all that, but Diego, I'll start with you. What do you have in store for us for season two? Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's simple. I just want to add something about the monologues. First of all, sure. That I mean, you, you, the the simple answer is that when Tony Gilroy writes them, something else happens, you know, and and it's it's because of that. It's because he's writing from the heart. Like you, you don't write to break people's hearts. You write from the heart, and that breaks people's hearts, you know. So I think the. the the, the the monologues here are not about information. They're not. They're just about the soul, you know, of the characters. And it's the moment they most almost say what you know, already know. And having the characters say it establishes a connection that is really strong. I I, I mean, anyway, I wanted to say that. Sorry, but uh, season season two. Uh, it's the, <laughs> what am I gonna say? Nothing. It's the four years before Rogue One. Uh, <laughs> it ends in the moment Rogue One starts. Uh, we're hoping you watch it and right away you see Rogue One. You'll see a different film. You'll, you'll see it through a different, you know, perspective. Uh, and you know that Cassian, so so much has to happen to this character. He's in, but he doesn't know what he just stepped in. You know, he doesn't speak the language. He said, kill me or let me in, but, uh, but now he has to find out what it means to be part of that and what's needed from him, you know, and become a spy, basically. I can't believe you ended the season like that and then made us all wait. <laughs> oh, God, well, we did. Um, yeah. How dare. No. Um, all right, I mean, Everyone knows we're covering going to go four years, as he said. Uh, what can I tell you? I mean, think about the revolution and think about it from, uh, from, uh, from Luthen Rail's point of view and Saw Gerrera's point of view and, and Mon Mothma's point of view. And they've started off as original gangsters in this thing and it's underground and it's secret and it's small and it's, and it's isolated and contained. And now, in four years, it's going to go big. So think about any restaurant that you knew that started off as a coffee shop and turned... So think about any startup company. What happens? And things get very, very complicated. And if you're 
stock and trade of your business is uh, paranoia and secrecy and betrayal and, and heavy consequences, um, expanding your business is really difficult. And then think about it from the imperial side. And they are getting very, very close to uh, a very important energy project. People may have heard of it. It's an energy project. And um, so uh, I, I guess that's not a surprise, but I think you'll see the wear and tear. You'll see all the stresses, all the, all the heartbreak and all the triumph of the 20 or 30 people that we're carrying forward with, with Cassian at the center. Um, you'll see those people stumble forward into a very complicated bit of chaos and history that we will pay attention to. So for the people that are here, you know, the people that are really care about Canon and the people that are really, and that, this audience is just, you know, we're gonna really try to, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna work the calendar. There's events on our calendar and you know what they are, some of them, and they're very important and we will play those out. Um, I will say one thing because I, I get it is a moment of quiet and everybody's here like this audience Not this audience, right? This is why we got to make the show. I mean I mean no, it's not and it's not like a, it's not a bullshit like I'm not like seriously When you leave whatever else you are you are investors in our show in a way you don't even understand because it's it's your passionate, insane loyalty that gave Disney the guts to gamble on something like this. If we don't have you, we can't play this hard. Well said. Well said. So I'm not telling you anything else. <laughs> That's it. That's all right. And or season two, it's complicated. Thank you both so much for being here. I need to interrupt you. Because uh, I, I you also, are more than welcome I have a feeling you. you're about to kick us out. Uh, you started like that, you know, like uh, to play you when off, you start like, oh well, <laughs> you go like shit. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna be in my car in, in in minutes, and I know this is because this gets to be seen everywhere in Latin America. It's yes, everyone's awake. So I'm just going to send a quick message to everyone watching this yes. from afar. Yes. Eh, un saludo a todos en América Latina. Eh, la, es, este evento fue en Londres, pero desde aquí les mando un abrazo y les agradezco a nombre de todo el equipo de Andor el, el apoyo, eh, el cariño. Y estamos ya haciendo la, la temporada 2, este, gracias a que ustedes vieron el show. Así que muchísimas, muchísimas gracias. And, Even Mexican flags here. What is this? <laughs> Sorry. No, you were no, saying. <laughs> absolutely. No, you know, if it were up to me, we would just continue talking all day, but unfortunately it's not. Thank you both so much, Gracias, for being here. I know you have a whole season of television to work on, so we are going to let you go. But Tony Gilroy and Diego Luna, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. More Star Wars Celebration Live from London coming up in just a minute. Don't you move a muscle.